So as I said, my name is Paul. I'm a PhD student in the machine learning department. And yep, that's me over there. I'm advised by two amazing advisors. Uh, LP Morrissey, that's the first one over there. That's a faculty in LTI. And all of you obviously know Russ, who works on deep learning and is mainly teaching this course. So the hope through this lecture is that I convey my passions towards multimodal machine learning. To all of you, this is an area I've been working on for quite some time. And over here, you can see on my GitHub, I've been collecting a bunch of resources, both in, in terms of reading lists for multimodal machine learning, and also all the code and research from papers that I've done in this field. So just to begin, we have actually a full multimodal course at CMU. This is a course that I've been involved in designing and teaching. The last time we offered this course, um, at least which I was involved in, was fall 2020. Um, and we have this amazing course website with all the materials from the course, including lecture videos that we recorded and put up on YouTube. So here you can see myself being really excited to give a lecture on deep generative models and their multimodal applications. So if you're fully interested in this course, uh, in this topic of multimodal learning, this is definitely a course I would check out. This semester, we're also giving an advanced topics course. Um, so that kind of, super, kind of continues the previous course, which is introduction. I'm really going into these core technical challenges and really outlining the open challenges in this multimodal field. So this is meant to be a discussion course where we give up all these papers that I think are important. And most importantly, these open challenges in multimodal learning, both before the deep learning era, during the deep learning era, and also what's gonna be the future of multimodal uh, beyond deep learning. And that's also another course website, which all of you should check out if you're interested in this field, which hopefully I'm gonna inspire all of you to be interested in after this lecture. So the point of today's lecture is to go through a couple of things. I'm gonna to try to condense both of these two courses, uh, the introduction to multimodal and advanced topics in multimodal into one lecture. I'm gonna go through some introductions, define what we mean by multimodal machine learning, and more importantly, give some historical perspectives, right? Nowadays, everyone is working on multimodal through the lens of deep learning, but multimodal as a field really existed way before deep learning. So what are some historical views on multimodal research? We're gonna cover some core technical challenges um, and the approaches to these technical challenges, both before deep learning and during deep learning. I'm gonna go through some multimodal research tasks and some new research directions, which I personally think are very important for new students to know about. So to begin, what is multimodal? Well, for most of you who haven't heard of multimodal in the machine learning context, but have in a statistics, statistics context, you probably would have heard of this thing called a multimodal distribution. And that's basically a distribution in which the PDF takes on multiple peaks, multiple local maxima in this distribution. And there's been a lot of work in statistics understanding what's the difference between a multimodal and unimodal distribution, and what are some challenges towards processing these multimodal distributions. And that very much inspires the field of multimodal machine learning. Obviously, we're not gonna look at probably density functions because if I were to ask you what's the PDF of natural images, or what's the PDF of natural language? No one can really give me an exact answer. But a lot of work in multimodal, oops, is actually inspired by these multimodal um, sensory modalities, right? We as humans have these five sensory modalities. We can see things, we can smell things, we can hear, we can touch, we can taste. And these five sensory modalities really inform how we as a human perceive the world. So even before the era of computational machine learning, People in psychology, people in neuroscience have been looking at how humans perceive these modalities, uh, how we process them individually and also in context of other modalities. So a lot of multimodal research has been inspired by these sensory modalities in humans. But obviously as computers, we can't really process um, taste or smell, right? Humans, uh, computers can process, however, these multimodal communicative behaviors. And these are what people in understanding human and human computer interaction call these three Vs, uh, verbal, vocal, and visual behaviors of how humans communicate with each other. And these again, constitute three modalities, which people usually study. Uh, the verbal modality looks at how we use words, both individually, and also words in conjunction with other words to form phrases and sentences. Uh, the, visual, the vocal modality looks at how we say these words through tone of voice. But beyond these words itself, we also look at vocal expressions like laughter, moans, shouts, screams. And this really starts going into the nonverbal aspect of human communication. And we also have visual. Um, when we communicate with each other, we use hand gestures, eye gestures, we use body language and postures. And these are all important facets of how we communicate with each other. 
uh, eye gaze in particular, eye gaze is a very, very important aspect of showing that you're paying attention to a speaker. And that's again, another example of visual gesture that people have been analyzing. And if there's one takeaway I want you to have, it is that multimodal is the science of multidisciplinary. We look at multimodal, it has been inspired by so many different research areas from psychology to medicine, to this new computational era of how we process speech and vision and language. And to all these new interactive dimensions of uh, multimodal for robotics and multimodal machine learning, getting the learning aspect into understanding multimodal data. So all of these definitions of modalities, how we, how we approach multimodal problems is really inspired by these interdisciplinary areas. And to be specific, some examples of modalities, we've looked at natural language, we look at visual, auditory, again, those are the three Vs of human communication. But beyond that, we also have robotics, people looking at how we can build touch sensors in the robots. We have, um, we have these sensory modalities such as smell and taste, which computers can't really process today, but hopefully they can in the future. We have these different high dimensional physiological signals like ECG signals, fMRI signals, all these different signals being used in a healthcare domain which constitute modalities. So in other words, modalities refer to a way in which something is expressed or perceived. And recently we've been looking at how we can perhaps come up with a more formal definition of multimodal. And essentially the world gives us so many expressions of data. And we always need some form of sensor to capture these types of data. And once you start capturing, sorry, using these sensors, you can then define the notion of uh, raw modalities to abstract modalities. So raw modalities are, for example, the video camera and speech signals capturing uh, my delivery of this lecture. Um, but we can slowly start processing these modalities in different ways. So we can take the speech signal, my raw speech signal, and you can start transcribing it to language and you get a different modality. You can start go taking this language and you can start doing further pro uh, processing to determine my sentiment, to look at how happy I am delivering this lecture. You can try to determine what language I'm determining, get delivering this lecture in and so on. So you have this whole spectrum from raw to abstract modalities. And this notion is important because when we look at multimodal, one of the big aspects we look at is how different these modalities are. If all these modalities came, like our sentences from the same, our sentences from the same language, we're not really having this, having this lecture on multimodal because all of them come from the same underlying distribution. So a lot of the research has been looking at how homogenous, which is how similar to how heterogeneous, which is how different these modalities are. And you can look at the spectrum of homogeneous modalities, such as images from two cameras, minus the differences in resolution or build of these two cameras, they're gonna give you the same image. And you can slowly start getting to more and more different modalities, such as text from different languages, which again, there might be a one-to-one -one mapping if the language families, are, language families are the same. You can start looking at language and vision where you have entirely different sensory modalities altogether, and you can go all the way towards the most different modalities you can imagine. And this idea of going from homogenous to heterogeneous modality is important because that then defines the different types of computation we need to apply on these modalities. So to summarize, multimodal machine learning is perhaps summarized as the study of computer algorithms that learn and improve through the use and experience of multimodal data. And multimodal artificial intelligence, which more broadly encapsulates machine learning and other aspects of artificial intelligence, studies computer agents that are able to demonstrate intelligent capabilities, such as understanding, reasoning, and planning through multimodal experiences and data. And when we use the word multimodal, it is to study the science of heterogeneity in data, how different these data sources are. So I'm gonna give a little bit of a historical view of multimodal machine learning. Uh, most of you are here in the lecture interested in deep learning aspect and how we can apply these deep neural networks to look at multimodal data. But just to go beyond before what happened before deep learning, there were several eras of multimodal machine learning. There was this behavior era, which is inspired by a lot of work in um, psychology and neuroscience. And then came the computational era where people started bringing these theories of psychology into the real world through computational tools. Uh, the interaction era, where people start looking at beyond static interactions, but to dynamic human-human and human-computer interactions. And finally, we all knew what happened in the early 2010s. There was this boom in deep learning, and as a result, a lot of the current work in multimodal deep learning that's happening today. So just to begin in the behavioral era, if there's one literature, one reference you wanna look at, is this probably this work by David McNeil, 
who was a psychologist, a psychologist at University of Chicago. And for many people at that time, people were looking at speech as a single fundamental modality of how humans communicate. And any of the other modalities beyond speech, such as gestures, was simply a byproduct. It was simply an addition. But for, for David, you know, he actually thought of gestures as this very, very fundamental aspect of human communication, which should be studied in itself. And some of his research was also inspired by this uh, McGurk effect. Oh, one thing. Do you know if I can play audio? Um, you should be able to share. Right. So one thing was this McGurk effect. And hopefully if I can play audio, uh, both of you all should try listening to this video clip and see what you observe. Can all of you hear that? Can I just say that one more time? I'm going to turn up the volume to maximum. Ba, 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 ba. So that was the first clip. And I'm going to play this second clip, and you're going to try to tell me if there's any difference in that second clip. All right, hopefully people at the back could hear that. But um, the interesting thing is if you were on your computer or on your phone and didn't look at a video and just listened to the audio clip, you probably thought that both audio clips were of the exact same sound. And the answer, the, the reason being, being is that they are actually of the exact same sound, right? The audio clips were exactly the same. And the only thing that changed was how the person, how the speaker in the video were moving their lips. So in the first one you probably heard ba, ba, ba with a B. And the second one, you probably heard fa, fa, fa with an F. And the only reason is that the person who's moving the lips are moving in a different way with the exact same audio clip. So then this kind of this thought experiment, this, um, this kind of, this experiment basically told people that, you know, all these people with speech recognition who have been just looking at speech and trying to recognize um, the transcripts might have been doing it differently, doing it incorrectly because how humans process speech is both through what we hear and also what we see. So this kind of invigorated a whole new era of research in building computational models for audio-visual speech recognition, beyond speech recognition in itself through audio, but also integrating the visual modality in how we can process speech. And people started collecting data sets of how humans are processing speech by looking at other speakers, both audio and visual, and building computational models. So back then it was you know, hidden Markov models. And people started realizing there was a huge gain to be obtained from uh, these audio visual models in red over these audio only models in blue. And that really kickstarted, was one of the pillars that kickstarted this computational era of multimodal machine learning by looking at audio visual speech recognition. At the same time, there was another big era of research in HCI, human computer interaction. People were thinking, if you wanna design computers that can interact with humans, well, first we have to understand how humans interact with humans and humans interact with humans, again, through these multimodal communicative behaviors, through language, through speech, through gestures. And one example of research here was that in effective computing. So how can we take expressions of humans um, through different behaviors and understand the emotions and the understand the sentiments that humans are conveying? And the third, probably a third biggest uh, driver for this computational era was that in multimedia computing. Right. The early, early, uh, late 1990s, early 2000s was when the internet started to come into fruition. We have so much unstructured data, such as images, video, text on the internet. How can we enable a better structure to the internet data, which happens to appear in all these multimodal, be, uh, multimodal sources? So how can we understand la language? How can we understand these images? How can we do things like image to text search or text to image retrieval and so on? A lot of the computational era work was driven by multimedia computing. And soon after, in the early 2000s, people started moving from static computing of multimodal data to interactive computing. So how can we actually model the interaction between humans and humans to better understand how humans can interact with computers? And there were a couple of key driving projects in this. There was this AMI project 
which basically took a bunch of hours of these meeting recordings of you know, humans in meetings, and basically looked at how humans interact by themselves and humans, how humans uh, respond to other, other people. Uh, there were other projects at CMU and, other, and elsewhere on looking at computers in HCI. Again, all of these are multi-sensor interactions. And finally, we, know, we all know what happened in the early 2010s. Like there was this boom in deep learning, deep neural networks. It started with image processing, but very, very soon, people started picking up on the ability of neural networks to do language understanding. And then people started looking at how we can use neural networks to do language and vision understanding. And there were a couple of you know, representative papers in this era. There was multimodal deep learning uh, by Andrew Wang's group in 2011. There was uh, multimodal learning with deep Boltzmann machines by Russ and his student in 2012. And there's some clear enablers for multimodal research. Right? We know that as the internet exploded, as computational resources exploded, we had much more access to multimodal data and also much more access to faster computer and GPUs for us to do processing on this high dimensional multimodal data. And perhaps the two key drivers of multimodal research were probably that in language and vision. We have these uh, high level visual features from CNNs and nowadays transformers, which are able to take these high dimensional images and compact them into high dim uh, low dimensional semantic representations. We have these language features that started with word embeddings and now these contextual sentence embeddings. They're able to model language representations through distributional hypothesis, basically uh, capturing the meaning of words by looking at the context of how these words appear. All of these, you know, all of these drivers in recent multimodal research enabled by deep learning. So that was a bit of a detour, a bit of a historical perspective. But now I want to go into some core technical challenges of multimodal learning. And the goal is that we have distilled these core technical challenges to be as different from uh, those traditional in machine learning as possible. And these challenges have been slightly studied in machine learning, but I think are specifically unique to the study of multimodal data. And a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these core challengers were distilled in this survey paper uh, by LP and his postdoc and his students about five years ago. It contains these five core challengers and a bunch of references. And since all of you are thinking five years is way too long in this deep learning era, we have this very, very new survey coming up, a new survey of these fundamentals and open challenges that's led by myself. And it's gonna include these five challenges plus a new one, uh, which I'll get into a little bit. And it contains a much larger set of citations and, and uh, taxonomies in this new field. So this paper should be coming up pretty soon. But just to today, just to give a very, very brief introduction of these you know, five core challenges. The sixth one is going to be a new direction, but at least it's five main challenges I'm gonna start talking about in this uh, multimodal field. So the very, very first two core challenges are perhaps what everyone would expect. The very first one is at least what everyone would expect in a multimodal and deep learning class, which is that you have all these different modalities coming in. For example, through these multimodal communicative behaviors, how do you learn a good representation of these modalities? And representation is something which is very abstract, but you've heard some of these definitions of good representations in this deep learning class. Um, what are some desirable properties? We're gonna to try to look at what are notions of good representations in this multimodal field. And after learning a representation, perhaps comes the most uh, core challenge in multimodal, which is most unique to multimodal, which is that idea of alignment. How do you bring together semantically elements in one modality with that in another? That's the alignment challenge. But first, let's look at representation. So multimodal representation could look like this. And this is something that I have dreamed of achieving and many, many people in this field have dreamed of achieving, which is to be able to take all these different high dimensional inputs from different spaces and bring them into one joint representation space. Right over there, you have you know, someone showing surprise with their mouth open. With their mouth open, you have someone saying the word wow, which is indicative of surprise. They should perhaps go over here in this era, in, in this, um, this region of the representation that represents surprise. You have someone saying, I like it in a very joyful tone with laughter. Um, you know, that should go into this area, this part of the multimodal representation. So how can you learn such a representation space? You know, what are different ways that we can achieve this? And in our survey, we have basically distilled uh, three main approaches. Uh, the first one is representation fusion, which is how can you bring these two modalities, take advantage of the complementary information of, uh, available in each community, and integrate this information into one common representation. And the main idea here is that you're trying to reduce the number of representations by going from a large number of sensory modalities into a single representation. 
This is a fusion problem. And again, going with this uh, human behaviors, you have you know, what a person is saying, what their visual gestures are, what their tone of voice is. Can you perform a fusion of representations in order to predict sentiment, which is going to be this uh, dynamically changing positive, negative scale of how the human believes, uh, what the person feels. So fusion is perhaps these, this concept of multimodal that has been studied for the most time. This has been around for many, many decades. And about like 30, 40 years ago, people have been looking at fusion. And back then there were just two approaches, these model agnostic approaches. It was either early fusion, mm. which you concatenate your data at the very beginning and you start processing your data, or late fusion, which is that you start processing your data and you concatenate or uh, combine the, the predictions at the very end. We were to talk to someone who's doing multimodal, like you know, back when LP or my advisors were their PhD students, you would say, oh, I've been doing early fusion for this problem. And they would say, oh, did you try late fusion? Or you say, I've been trying late fusion for this problem. They would say, oh, did you try early fusion? Because those are the only two approaches present. But obviously nowadays we know that there's many, many different types of intermediate approaches uh, based on neural networks, based on kernel learning, based on graphical models. And all of these kind of have their different uh, pros and cons. So some of the early work in fusion, for example, came from the idea of these uh, multimodal autoencoders. This was um, one of the papers which I referenced as being pretty seminal in the early 2010s, which started people started looking at multimodal deep learning. And essentially what they did was they took an audio input and video input, they encoded into a shared representation mm -hmm. through autoencoders and try to decode these, um, like you, you all have seen autoencoders, try to reconstruct the input data uh, back to audio and visual. And this exactly was used for audiovisual speech recognition, which was that motivating aspect of both behavioral and computational aspects of multimodal learning. And they actually found that this, this approach was very useful. Like, you know, people haven't really explored multimodal deep learning before. There's just a very simple approach of kind of taking audiovisual, getting representations through autoencoders, and concatenating your data at the representation level, level was actually very effective in doing audiovisual speech recognition. Uh, the good thing about this is that it's an unsupervised representation learning method, in which case you can kind of pre-train your, uh, pre your representations through individual modalities. So you don't have that much audio and visual paired data. You can just pre-train the audio part of your autoencoder. You can pre-train the visual part of your autoencoder. Uh, you can also drop in other notions of unsupervised representation learning methods you see in the class, like uh, different types of Boltzmann machines, uh, denoising autoencoders. And one thing they also found to be really useful was that I'm gonna dynamically drop out different parts of the modality. So sometimes I'm gonna use both audio and visual to reconstruct my data. Sometimes I'm gonna drop out my audio to force my video to be able to predict video and also audio. And I'm gonna do that vice versa. And this was really useful in order to um, um, allow the model to just rely on one modality at test time instead of relying on both modalities. Now drop like keeping audio and dropping video and, and vice versa. And one interesting experiment they had was that um, this hearing to see experiment. So I'm going to train without audio, try to learn a shared representation. And during testing, because you're learning a shared representation, you can just put in all video instead. And this actually, actually worked pretty well. So even though you've never really seen video during our training, you can kind of give video during testing through this video only auto encoder and still be able to make a reasonable prediction. So here's an example, you know, here, these are examples of representation fusion, right? The goal is that you're starting from uh, two modalities and you're going to just one representation. You're reducing the number of representations by combining information. Another example were uh, multimodal deep Boltzmann machines. Um, again, instead of autoencoder, they use this probabilistic uh, model of Boltzmann machines, again, to kind of combine image and text into one joint representation. A uh, good thing here is that you are able to, because this is a joint probabilistic model, you can then um, you know, learn a joint distribution and sample from this distribution. So if I give a particular image, I'm gonna learn the image distribution, I can sample from the text that maximizes the joint distribution of image and text. And that enables me to do retrieval. And one thing they found is that uh, normally people are just using images to do prediction, but having text information at the same time to learn a joint representation can help you do visual predictions at the same. And there's a bunch of other examples, um, all of these using either different notions of how you define your representation. It can be through 
uh, deep belief networks, autoencoders, deep Boltzmann machines, and so on. What about something more recent? Um, so here's some example of something more recent, um, and this is also in the context of supervised learning. So in the previous slide, it's also in the context of unsupervised learning. So using autoencoders, Boltzmann machines to, learn, to first pre-train a representation and then transfer into a downstream task. These are some examples of directly predicting the sentiment based on representation fusion. So over here, you have you know, these human behaviors, uh, text, image, and audio. And the goal is to learn a representation that allows us to predict sentiment, which is how uh, happy or sad a person is while expressing their opinions about a concept. And one thing that is important for understanding uh, human behaviors is this idea of different types of interactions that appear in multimodal data. So you have unimodal data. Um, that can typically be ambiguous, like this movie is fair or this movie is sick, like sick means either good or bad in different contexts. You have bimodal interactions that take whatever you're saying in language and contextualizing them and what uh, the person is expressing through their gestures, right? So if this, person, this movie is sick plus smile, that'll be really, really positive, but this movie is sick plus frown, that'd be really negative. And you can then extend this definition to trimodal interactions. We're looking at how all of these different parts contribute to your label. So how do you actually capture all these different, different uh, interactions? Well, um, there's been work in these tensor representations. So essentially tensor representations take uh, two representations and learn the outer product. So this outer product basically captures every element of your first feature vector multiplied by every possible element of your second feature vector. So that's why this you know, four by four turns, four dimension, four dimension turns to a four by four matrix in the case of two dimensions. So that basically models how every feature in one modality can interact with all other features of the other modality. And one important thing is that you might also wanna add a one to this, um, to this outer product, because if you don't have a one, all you're capturing is bimodal interactions. If you're adding a one, then you're actually keeping the unimodal representations there uh, by themselves. Right? Because one outer product with the other feature vector just gives you that other feature vector. So this is what we, but, but people have been looking at um, using these tensors to do representation fusion. Again, you know, going back you know, to, to the basics, so you're taking two representations from different modalities and you're trying to combine them into one representation. And this can again be extended to three different modalities. Um, if you wanna model the three Vs, text, image, and audio. So give, this gives you a cubic tensor of trimodal interactions, unimodal and bimodal. And this was found to be really, really helpful. Uh, outperforming you know, ways of just like concatenating uh, or these like autoencoders in actually learning these uh, sentiment predictions. There's a couple more examples. I'm just gonna put references here uh, because I don't have time to get into them. Um, learning these tensors are, which are hard dimensional are very, very difficult. So there's low rank approximations to make them faster. Um, there's different you know, things that generalize these tensors called multiplicative interactions of arbitrary order which you can use for learning these joint representations. And there's also work in kind of sequence fusion. So we're looking at static data, but if you have a sequence, you have a language sequence, you have a visual sequence, how can you perform fusion into joint representations? There's one reference over there. So that was fusion. The second perhaps parallel idea that people have been looking at is this idea of coordination. And in contrast to fusion, Coordination looks at keeping the same number of representations from both modalities. So you have two modalities coming in. I'm gonna keep two representations, one for each. But the difference is that these two representations, I want to coordinate them using some particular function. So I want them to be related in some way. And perhaps this is the best way of looking at representation coordination. It's about learning a representation space where you're gonna put all your data from, in this case, images and text into this representation space. But this, this representation space captures some semantic uh, notion of distance and similarity. So over here you have see, on, on the left, you see all these, um, these images of cars in a cluster. So the, the plus sign will be these representations of images of cars. And this red circle is the representation of the word auto, um, which, which means cars. And likewise, on the bottom right, you have these representations of cats and dogs, which are nearby. Uh, but the image representations yeah, I mean, are clustered with respect to the semantic concept, and they're well aligned with this text representation of cats and dogs. So again, you see here that you're kind of keeping these image representations and your text representations separate. They're not all going into the same point in this representation space, they're at different points, but these points are coordinated by some similarity function. 
So a lot of work in representation coordination has been to study um, after encoding my text and image, for example, how can I define a suitable similarity metric in order to define the shape of this representation space? And there's a couple of notions, for example, um, uh, cosine similarity is one common example. So these high dimensional vectors are gonna point in certain directions. Cosine similarity computes how, how much they're parallel in the same direction. There's also margin losses. So for example, if I have some positive examples of images that I want to align with uh, text or other concepts, I want them to be closer with respect to some margin with respect to the negative examples, which are images and random samples of text I get from the data set. And there's quite a few good, ex good um, use cases of this representation coordination. Uh, most of these cases are not gonna be in prediction, which we saw for fusion, but over here, one example is this for um, aligning images and text. So you have an image over here, you're gonna process it through a convolutional network. You're going to have this, um, this caption, which corresponds to the image. You're gonna, pat, you're gonna encode it by a CNN LSTM. And then you're going to get into this multimodal space in which you are kind of going to, to estimate some uh, similarity. You're gonna enforce some similarity. And the good thing about this, this form of coordination is that you can do really cool things like vector space arithmetic. This is probably one of my favorite examples of uh, coordinating multimodal representations. So if you look at the top left, I'm gonna take a blue car, I'm gonna encode it into its representation space. It's gonna be some point, that's an image only representation. I'm gonna minus the representation of blue um, through this text representation. And I'm gonna add the represent representation of red as a word. And then I'm gonna get some representation. I'm gonna get some vector into this space. And I'm gonna to try to look for the nearest image representations uh, to this vector. And you're actually gonna get images of red cars. And likewise, you can do this for you know, school buses, dresses, cats. You can see like this is a cool example of uh, representing an airplane minus the representation of flying, adding a representation of sailing, and you actually are able to retrieve images of sailboats, which is the sailing method of transportation as, as compared to flying. And all of this is possible because you're learning a coordinated representation space that first of all keeps images and text representations separate. Like if they were all the same, you wouldn't be able to do this type of retrieval. So you have to keep it separate, but at the same time, they're separate in such a way that they respect similarity measures in both image and text space. So here's a good example of uh, representation and coordination. Another example that everyone has probably seen is this clip model, which is from OpenAI just last year a very, very large kind of bringing these representation coordination methods to very large scales. So over here, they're basically taking um, pairs of images and text, they're encoding the image, they're encoding the text into representations. And over here, what you see is basically a similarity uh, matrix. So um, I1 dot T1 is basically uh, an unnormalized version of cosine similarity. They're basically trying to bring these representations of images and text close together into this representation space, according to cosine similarity and different ones far apart. So essentially training using contrastive learning. And one really, really good benefit of that is that you can use it for zero shot prediction. So given a new photo of an image, I can encode it into this representation space, and I can then take any set of semantic categories in language that I want, right? I can define a, a new set of categories, like a photo of a dog, even though this model has never seen this exact sequence of words, a photo of a dog but you can encode this word, uh, this category of photo of a dog into a text representation space. And by comparing the cosine similarities, you are basically able to categorize this new image into this new set of categories. So some examples here, right? This is a new example of a television studio and you as a user, you're actually able to put in all of these different categories which you want to classify this image into. A photo of a television studio, a photo of a podium indoor, a photo of a conference room and so forth. The model has not exactly seen all of these phrases by themselves, but they have learned a generalizable text encoder such that encoding all of these phrases into the space allows you to look at um, the text representation that is closest to the image representation of the given image. It's able to do zero shot classification in this way. Um, so that's an example. So this, you know, you've not really seen these photos of Siberian Huskies in this exact cartoonish way. It's seen real Huskies before, but it's still able to kind of uh, learn how to put this representation of this cartoon image nearby to those actual real photos of Siberian Huskies that it's seen. 
And that's not perfect. Um, I guess here's a failure case, right? The number of objects um, is, is not able to kind of correctly identify the number of objects in the image. But yeah, example of representation and coordination. And there's a couple of more examples. I'm not gonna get into details. Uh, essentially, all these other extensions basically look at different ways of parameterizing the similarity function that you're defining on top of these coordinate representations. Uh, over here, looking at ordered or hierarchical similarity measures. I've, uh, and this is the kind of correlation measures that people have used to look at how we can uh, embed, uh, coordinate different embeddings from image and language. So last one. Last one, the last type of representation is that what we call fission. So we recall fusion takes in two modalities to get one representation. Coordination maintains two representations, one for each modality. Fission tries to break down your data into more representations than the number of modalities you actually started with. And why would you want to do this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. In order to, um, you, you can actually look, look at better internal structure if you're factorizing your representations into different parts, right? This takes advantage of uh, the clustering you, you can see in your data, different factors of variation you have in your data, modality specific information you have in your data. There's certain advantages to kind of breaking that representation into more parts than a number of modalities you started with. So here's a very good example. This is actually a paper I did early on in my PhD. Again, we're looking at these expressions of human language through these three modalities, language, vision, and audio. But the idea here is that you wanna break it down into different types of factors. We have a multimodal factor that basically analyzes the underlying uh, relationships between language and vision, right? So in this case, it was sentiment. So how happy I am is gonna determine how, uh, what I say about the movie, uh, what I express through my gestures and what the actual sentiment label, the data, the video was from. But at the same time, we also have these language specific factors, right? I myself, regardless of what sentiment I feel, I say things in a certain way. And that's gonna be different from what the way that you say things, you know, I myself, I'm going to have different expressions in my gestures. I can be more expressive or someone else is not that expressive, regardless of what the actual sentiment is. So that actually motivates breaking down these factors into multimodal factors, which in this case predict sentiment. And also these very specific factors, maybe one for language, one for visual and one for audio. And that's exactly what we did. So given all this data, we defined this generative model in this case, the, the Zs are your factors. Your Zy is this multimodal factor that influences all three modalities. So that's just in general, how happy I am today. And the Za1, Za2, Za3, these are specific factors that govern uh, my own expression of language, independent of my happiness, uh, my, no my own expression of my gestures, independent of happiness, and my own tone of voice, my pitch and frequency in my voice, independent of happiness. And those four factors together, uh, generate my data. So we're going to define this generative model. So here's an example of representation fission, right? We started with three modalities, but we ended up with four distinct uh, factorized independent representations. So this is useful for a couple of things. Um, in the case of, you know, at least things that we can generate because we can't really generate videos. In the case of generating these two modalities, SVH and MNIST, using three factors, you're actually going to be able to control each factor and look at different generations of your data. So if I fix ZA1, so ZA1 is meant to represent the style of my first data set. So that style keeps the same, but I'm gonna change the label. So I'm gonna get zero through nine in the exact same way that a zero was written. Likewise, I can fix uh, my second factor, that my second MNIST specific factor. So I can get zero to nine in the exact same way that zero was written, you know, to the, with a slant to the side. And then I can also fix my, uh, my joint label factor. So that tells, what number it is. So the number is gonna stay the same, right? The five is gonna stay the same, but you're gonna write it in different ways. Uh, one in the way of my, my SVHN image data set and one in the way of this MNIST data set. So three separate factors basically gives me three ways of controlling how I can generate my data. Uh, another good thing about, you know, kind of breaking down these representations is that now you can analyze the influence of each representation, right? I can look at the gradient of um, these language only factors contributing towards my label. And that basically tells me how important language was towards influencing my prediction of sentiment. So over here you see when, I, when, the, when the speaker says the word very profound and deep, the language factor suddenly increases, the gradient of the language factor suddenly increases. 
And otherwise, the language factor is not super useful. So again, breaking down your factors into multiple components allows you to interpret and understand each component, which is otherwise not possible if you had like a single joint factor, uh, as we saw in representation fusion. So there's more extensions, um, more extensions, a lot of it based on disentanglement, given your data, can you break it down into different factors? Um, I also motivated clustering as an important application of how we can break down and separate our data. So there's some work in matrix factorization and feature clustering, again, um, for representation fission. And here, here's just one example of how um, some, some folks at Stanford kind of built upon our work and did something similar in kind of breaking down these representations for robotics. So to summarize um, this first part of the lecture, we look at different ways of representing multimodal data. And even though the specific ways you know, differ across a large number of papers, there's three main common themes. One is that of fusion. So going from a large number of modalities to a common representation. And this is useful because it can sometimes allow us to learn joint distributions using generative models. It can allow us to generate missing modalities by learning joint distributions. And it's really useful when you're directly using this representation for prediction, for fusion tasks. The second parallel idea is to do coordination, which keeps the same number of representations across your modalities, but enforces some notion of similarity or structure between them. This is useful because it allows you to do retrieval if your notion of similarity is you know, cosine or margin similarity. Uh, it respects similarity and you can kind of compose it in different ways. You're keeping your representations separate, but you can then compose them as we saw in the, um, the red car minus red plus blue to get a blue car example. And the final one we saw was fission, which is to take a number of modalities but break down the representations into more parts than what you originally started with. And this is useful because it's more interpretable, visualizable, especially if you break it down into more components. It also enables controllable generation with respect to each representation. And sometimes it can enable you to do both prediction and generation. So the common representation for prediction and your separate representations for generation. Cool, so that was representation. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about alignment. So alignment is probably one of the biggest challenges in multimodal. So representation is a challenge, but people have been looking at representation in all aspects of deep learning so far. But alignment is really something that is very, very specific to multimodal. And it's about learning the direct relations between elements from two or more modalities. Say so this is one modality, this is the other modality. How can I relate one element from one to elements in the other? And there's two types of alignment. One is that of, of explicit alignment, where the goal, your end goal, is to exactly find this correspondence and find this alignment, and then you're done. The other type of alignment is that of implicit alignment. So your goal is something else, it's some downstream task, but it's just alignment helps you as an intermediate step towards predicting this task. So what's explicit alignment, right? Your goal is, your end goal is to find these correspondences. So for example, if you have speech data and you have language data and I want to align when each word was spoken with every part of your speech. Right? This word was spoken for this duration, and this, spoken, this word was spoken for this other duration. That's an explicit alignment problem of aligning speech to transcripts. Another example is image and text. So if I have an image and I'm gonna ask you a question, uh, you know, localize the rocks along the right side of the stairs. Right? That's an alignment problem because you want to find the direct correspondence between uh, what I'm instructing you in speech with that part of the image. And these are explicit alignment problems. And for implicit alignment, um, again, the, the end goal is not to do alignment, but the end goal is to do something else. Over here, the end goal is to either do image retrieval, image captioning, right? You have an image and you have, um, you have some desired caption or desired that you wish to retrieve. So over here, you know that in order to retrieve this image from this caption, you have to understand what a dog means. You have to un understand the, the, the localize the image of a dog in the image. You have to understand what a tennis ball means. You have to understand what swimming and murky waters means. And you have to do alignment between all of these parts of your speech to all of these parts of the image in order to successfully retrieve this caption from the image. So that is more implicit alignment. So one very successful case of implicit alignment is this uh, visual captioning with soft attention, which I believe you've seen before in the class, right? I'm gonna take an image. I'm gonna try to generate word by word a caption that describes this image. 
And essentially, you idea, like every, whenever you generate a word, you want that word to actually attend to a particular part of the image that is aligned to, right? So over here, when you generate the word throwing, you want it to actually highlight the person that is throwing the, the Frisbee. And if you're generating the, the park, you're going to actually want to highlight the region of the image that represents the park. So that's actually the implicit alignment problem. And the way you did this, uh, you could do this is no. normally if you don't have attention, you're just going to encode the image through a CNN and to get some uh, distributional feature of the image. And in which case you will auto regressively generate every word by every word. But an attention model that enables implicit alignment will look something like this. So you take an image, again, you're going to use a CNN, get your features. And every step, you're going to first uh, learn some hidden representation, which is then going to give you a distribution. Um, a multinomial distribution over different locations which you go attend to in the image. And this location will then attend to your actual features. That actually, that gives you the heat map of alignment where every word is attending to it, so that word is being generated. Uh, taking an expectation of that heat map over your features gives you your actual representation that was attended to. And you can then use that to generate uh, every word, right? So you generate a new word, you're, gonna, you're again gonna generate an attention map over your image features. That gives you the second heat map over your image that you're gonna to use to generate your second word and so on. So these type of attention models are actually able to gonna give you this alignment approach that tells you which part of the image was being looked at when each word was generated. So nowadays, people still use these um, attention models and recurrent neural networks, but there's been, there's been this boom of interest in these self-attention models, right? And these self-attention models, uh, which you have covered in previous lectures, is exactly doing some form of implicit alignment, right? These contextualized sentence encodings, right? And these self-attention models, basically taking each word and you're looking at all the other words that are related to this word. And that's how you get your contextual sentence embeddings. So you've seen self-attention for language-only data. You've seen these like transformer models, you've seen how they can be pre-trained, but how can you learn these contextualized representations from different uh, modalities? Well, one easy way is to just kind of concatenate your data, your language data, visual data, audio data at the input level. So kind of like early fusion, you're kind of concatenating all your data across a sequence dimension, and you're gonna slap on a really, really large transformer self-attention model. And this transformer self-attention, this is still gonna work. It might be a bit computationally inefficient because you're dealing with very, very long sequences, almost like three times the original sequence, but it's still gonna work because this transformer is going to look at all your words. You're gonna look at all frames in the image, all parts of your audio, and it's gonna learn a full self-attention over all of them. And each of these self-attention is gonna relate one part of the word with all the other words, and also this word with all parts of the image and all parts of the audio. Um, and obviously there's better approaches. Um, one example of an approach is to use cross-modal transformers. So instead of concatenating all your data at the beginning and putting a transformer on top of that, I'm gonna first process data from each modality using their own transformers. Um, and, and because the dependence, the transformer dependence on your sequence length is quadratic, this is gonna save computation quite a bit. Right? So I'm gonna get these individual feature vectors. But then how do you actually model the relationships in this case, the alignment relationships from one modality to the other. Well, you can design something called a cross-modal transformer. Essentially, this cross-modal transformer, if you zoom it in, what it's doing is that with two modalities, it's gonna treat one modality as a query, and it's gonna treat the other modality as the key and value. So if you recall this query and key, it's gonna tell you how much modality A attends to each part of modality B, based on, a, again, cosine similarity, because you're taking this inner product between your query and key. So this inner product tells you the attention weights that I'm gonna to use to uh, use for modality A to attend to modality B. And then actually multiplying by the values of modality B gives you the amount of attention that I've used from one modality to the other. And again, all of these, all of these attention weights, all of these scores are implicitly capturing some form of semantic alignment based on a particular time step in the first modality with respect to a particular time step in the second modality. And there's this very cool paper recently um, that I just saw on Twitter last week, actually, that tried to visualize what exactly these multimodal transformers are doing. It's been a bunch of works, uh, training and pre-training these multimodal transformers, 
bunch of work studying these in isolation, but this gives a unified framework for visualizing the workings of these transformers. So over here, you have the input, uh, you have a sequence of words, you have a part of the image. All these transformers do is they first start by encoding, but by separating out the words into parts of, uh, into your, your, um, your individual tokens. So they're gonna break down your image into individual regions, and it's gonna define all these attentions, right? Text and image tokens coming in, attending to themselves, attending to each other. So how can you figure out how this model is working? Well, they basically took the attention maps and they broke it down into four parts. Uh, one part is vision to vision, right? You're going to use the vision tokens to attend to other vision tokens. You're also gonna use image tokens to, uh, language tokens to attend to other language tokens. You have language to vision and vision to language. These are your four ways of capturing alignment across your two modalities. So you look at vision to vision, you can start with an input token and you can see all the other image tokens that it was attending to. And over here, if you look at the starting image token being the, the surface head, it does capture the other parts of the surfer's body, which you know, semantically captures the idea that this is a surfer. And likewise, if you look at a uh, language to language tokens, if you, look, if you start with the word surfer and you look at how this surfer is attending to other parts of the image, you are able to align surfer with the fact that you know, this is a verb phrase what the surfer is doing and the preposition uh, or the object that is riding on a wave. And more importantly, what you know you might care about is this language to vision attention and vision to language attention. So for language and vision, uh, you're going to start with a visual token, and you can, which is the image of the surfer's head, and you can see the attention weights of all the other words that this surfer's head was attending to. And it does capture the implicit alignment that it is a surfer, and that's the part with highest attention. And vice, uh, vice versa for, for uh, vision to language. You're gonna start with the word surfer and it's gonna capture out the entire smooth image region of the surfer inside the image. So together, you know, these multimodal transformers are probably one of the state-of-the-art ways of capturing the idea of implicit alignment in these multimodal models. There's more notions of alignment, both explicit and implicit. If um, some of you are familiar, this, familiar with signal processing, dynamic time warping is a good example of explicit alignment. So in that case, you're looking at two different time series of data, like my speech signals and my transcript, and how do you align them with each other? And for implicit alignment, there's more examples of attention models and multimodal transformers in this space. Cool. So now we've looked at representation and alignment. Those are perhaps the two core challenges that are essential to any multimodal problem. You always have to represent your data and you always have to do some alignment either explicitly or implicitly as an intermediate step. And then you're gonna see some branching out. You're gonna see certain tasks that require more reasoning. Uh, so we define reasoning as kind of the composition of these evidences into higher level abstract predictions. So that's more the decision level. And some tasks that are gonna require translation. So in this case, translation, you don't care that much about making a prediction, but you're trying to map from one modality to the other. So I'm gonna go through both of these pretty briefly. For reasoning, again, um, for reasoning, the goal is to find these underlying hierarchical structure. You're gonna, you kind of represent your images, you kind of broken down your images into different parts, your images of your dog, your images of your tree and so on. You represent your images. You've also represented your text, right? You've kind of tokenized your text, you learn word vectors for each one of them. And you also align, align them. You align the fact that black represents the color of the dog. Dog represents you know, this part of the image. Uh, tree, the word represents this part of the image. How then can you take all of these local evidences and compose them into a hierarchical form, into, form, into more abstract concepts required for your prediction? So that's the underlying challenge of reasoning. And there's two main examples of reasoning. One in which you would define it through knowledge. So over here, you're actually seeing how the syntax of your caption is defining this tree structure for which you should compose your data. So that's defined through knowledge. And the other case we discovered through data. So you have large amounts of data. Can you actually discover some form of reasoning structure in this case through knowledge graphs to enable your prediction? So for reasoning defined through question syntax, there's a lot of examples. Um, recently, people have been calling this field neurosymbolic, right? You're kind of combining the benefits of using neural networks, such as CNNs and LSTMs to represent your data 
with the symbolic aspect of actually, uh, for example, parsing a question and symbolically composing the parts of your question into your answer. So over here you see, where's the dog? You're gonna first parse your question. You're going to identify that it's a dog, in which case you wanna localize, which is the alignment problem. You wanna align the fact that it's a dog with parts of the image that represents the dog. And you're also gonna parse it to uh, understand what type of question you're asking, which is a where type of question. So the where question, you're gonna align it with your layout, which tells you the locations of all these particular parts of the objects. And together that gives you the answer that the dog is on the couch. Um, so this, this sequence of compositions from individual evidences to actual label is defined through your syntax in the question. And over here, um, all these individual parts, you know, before you actually start composing, they've already defined all these individual parts, like first the attending to a particular part of the image to find the location of the dog. That's the alignment problem. And also perhaps classification problems, right? classifying where given the image and the parts that you identified. And this can be made arbitrarily complex. Um, for example, you wanna understand, answer the question, is there a red shape above a circle? You might have to first attend to the red shape, attend to the circle, uh, combine if there's actually a red shape above the circle and measure whether the existence of this particular object. So here's an example of, you know, again, defining the compositional structure of how you're gonna build up these evidences through question syntax. Uh, in addition to using questions, using syntax, another type of composition is through logical reasoning. So over here, like people have realized that most of these VQA questions are actually through, uh, can be expressed through logical quantifiers, right? So for example, is there a beer? Is a man not wearing shoes? Is a negation question. Is the man not wearing shoes and is there a beer? Is a negation and a conjunction question. So by creating such a data set, they also provide opportunities for integrating logical reasoning into these neural networks. So again, if you look at this, it's kind of complicated diagram, but if you think about it in terms of the core challenges, you again have an image and a question, you're gonna represent them in some way. And then it's, then it's this alignment problem of basically contextualizing your image with your question. And once you've done this alignment step, it's this compositional reasoning step where you're defining the logic over which you're gonna answer the question. So that was the first part on more um, defining, predefining types of composition. You can also learn this composition through data. This part is not super interesting, but if you have all these types of composition and you don't know what to do with them, you can basically do architecture search. You can basically do architecture search over all possible types of compositions to decide the best one for your label. So over here, this is um, multimodal fusion architecture search for healthcare data. You just start by defining all these local comp components for fusion and you're gonna rely on architecture search to find the best combination. Now there's more examples of reasoning, both defined through knowledge and through discover through data. For defining through knowledge, there's tree and graphical reasoning, there's causal reasoning, uh, interactive reasoning, which extends the static type of reasoning to reinforcement learning settings. And for discovering through data, people have also explored using external knowledge graphs, multimodal common sense, all these types of external data to do reasoning. Cool, just two more challenges. Uh, the fourth one, as I said, in parallel, like once you've done representation and alignment of your data, you can do reasoning. Your goal is to more to do prediction. But at the same time, there's also this translation problem, how we can kind of map from one modality to the other. So here's actually one early example, which I really like. Over here, you're given this, um, I'm gonna play this clip in a little bit, but you're gonna start with this movie. And from this movie, I'm gonna extract transcripts of what the actors are saying, and also the audio streams of, what, um, of how the actors are saying it. And my goal here is to kind of build this virtual human, which represents the actors in a scene in this photorealistic but simulated type of way. And ideally, these virtual humans should be able to say the same things and say the, say the, the same things in the same way that these actors are saying it. Essentially, both, um, both the speaker and listener, uh, both the speaker, uh, text and gestures. And at the same time, I'm also gonna model listener. So the person who is not saying anything, I'm also gonna try to model that by translating from this real video to these um, virtual humans. So I'm just gonna play this video clip to motivate translation. Snotty little bastard. Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick 
gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched. And why did he have to be transferred? Colonel? Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't you? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. I'm sorry, when you went back, you open. cut these guys loose. Your Honor, you are to Don't see you don't have to answer the question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? The truth. You can't handle the truth. Yeah, that's translation. We're going from all transcript and audio speed to the uh, visual adjustment. There's a lot of work being done in this, especially in you know, human computer interaction and computer graphics. We want to take these realistic videos and perhaps translate them into something uh, like virtual humans that we can then use to render or, or give you know, different transcripts and different audio streams for them to say. So translation, again, is the process of changing data from one modality to the other. And this, this challenge is hard for a couple of reasons. Well, the mapping, learning the mapping from one modality to the other is obviously difficult. But more, also more difficult is the fact that this translation can be pretty open-ended. It can be very subjective. It's not super clear how to evaluate this translation in many cases. But just to briefly summarize, there's been work in both example-based translation. So you have a dictionary, this local dictionary of how I can translate, that can help me do my translation. Or the other way is to learn a purely you know, model-based generative model from uh, the first modality to the second, do that during training, and just deploy the model during testing for translation. Let's show a few other cool examples. This is an example of translating from uh, language to gestures. So I have this language coming in and I have this stick figure of a virtual human. And this human can actually follow these gestures by jogging a few steps or stepping forward and turning around or a kneeling person raising their hands and trying to get up. I'm not going to get too much into translation, but um, I'm going to add a couple of links. And translation is one case where you're trying to map from one modality to the other. There's actually a few other dimensions. So just based on how big or how small your input and output is, if you're going from really, really large inputs into a smaller output, that can be seen as summarization. There's been some work in multimodal summarization by taking like, different modalities in a video and trying to summarize them both in terms of images and text. Uh, translation, as we covered, is taking you know, things of approximately the same level, same amount of information, and translating it from one to the other. And there's also generation. So generation looks at taking data that is smaller, perhaps in the form of latent variables like Z, and really generating you know, higher dimensional multimodal data. So if this Z represents you know, the idea that this dog is on the beach, it should be able to generate images, captions, and audio of this dog on the beach. So one interesting thing is I put crash over here because I was thinking of what sounds would you hear at a beach? And normally you would hear these waves kind of hitting, hitting the, the sand, right? And I actually couldn't find a good word for what that, um, what that audio sounds like. So that's actually a cool example of how we want to do generation or alignment between these different modalities. But sometimes these alignments, this synchronization doesn't exist between these modalities. Right? A lot of these audio concepts can't really be expressed through language. Cool. So one last core challenge. We have looked at representing data, aligning data, just uh, two possible branches of either reasoning in which you want to do a prediction or translating if you wanted to generate data from a different modality. But co-learning is one other example. So co-learning is kind of parallel to the other challenges. But essentially here, you're trying to transfer knowledge between modalities, um, either through representations or through models. So normally, this can be seen as both unimodal and multimodal problems. So normally, let's say I have a modality one, which I want to do a prediction. And this can be, you know, give an image, classify what type of objects are in the image. And people have often found that a second external additional modality can help, right? If I have word embeddings that tells me the structure of these concepts, that can help me classify my images. If I have um, image and captions, which give me a lot more of image and caption data than I have just through images, that can help. If I have knowledge graphs telling me how each part of the image relates to other parts and to the label, 
that can also help. Right? All these are examples of using an external modality, trying to transfer the, the knowledge from the modality to, to my first modality for prediction. And this is particularly useful if the modality I care about has either limited data or limited labels or noisy labels, or is in, is in general a low resource modality. Um, often to do this, you need some notion of pairing in your data. So if you don't have any pairs, you don't, you're not gonna be able to use modality two to help your first modality. And this pairs can come in the example of you know, purely parallel data or partially parallel data. So here's actually a good example. So in this case, this is our work um, early on during my PhD. Um, you're gonna start with some notion of language. You're gonna, someone's gonna say, today was a great day. And normally what you would do is you would just take this language data, limited representation and try to predict sentiment. So this is just language-based sentiment analysis that people have studied in NLP. But sometimes we also have this paired visual data that you, you obtain in the, in the form of videos and so on. So how can you actually leverage this external visual data? So one thing that we found to be really useful was to do uh, co-learning via translation. So I'm gonna take my language data, I'm gonna learn a representation, and this representation should try to capture the visual representations as much as possible. In other words, I want to try to hallucinate what the person was looking like when they said this, this, uh, this particular sentence. Now, a lot of this motivation came from machine translation, right? If you have English data, you're gonna try to translate it to French data. The representation that you learn in the middle can be informative for both English and French. So we had this forward encoder and decoder that encodes my language into my representation, tries to predict the visual data. In the same time, a cyclic loss, it tries to make sure that this representation contains as much language data as possible to make sure I don't lose any information. And we found that this method actually outperforms these language only method by quite a bit. And most of it is because of the information transfer that my visual modality provides me with. Uh, the other good thing is that during testing, all I need is language, right? All I'm just using this visual modality as a, um, an additional objective during training, but during testing, all I need is language. So I'm still gonna be kind of robust to any noise and imperfection in the visual modality. Uh, recently, people have been able to kind of reproduce or extend this result at a much larger scale. Uh, people have been looking at these mask language models like your BERT transformer models. So that's just language only, right? Learning contextual language representations. But what they found is that if you take these language representations and you try to further fine tune them by predicting images that co-occur together with language. So for example, this word humans predict image of a human um, speaking, you know, try to predict this, this image of someone holding a recorder and speaking into it. This actually improves both your language model and also improves your language vision tasks. So this is again, trying to transfer knowledge from your visual modality to your language modality, where your main goal is, to do, is still to do prediction in a language modality. And a couple other examples I'm adding here, um, co-training, this very, very early paper on machine learning called co-training is again an example of a co-learning problem where you have you know, maintaining both like labeled data and more unlabeled data from other modalities, from, from different views of the data and seeing how that can help. Uh, visually supervised language models is exactly this figure that I'm showing. And it's also a cool survey paper that kind of summarizes quite a few directions in co-learning recently. Cool, so just to summarize, those were like five main challenges in multimodal. Uh, so most of these are kind of by design very specific to this field of multimodal. Uh, people have also studied them in machine learning, deep learning, but you know, these core challenges are really what makes, what makes multimodal special. And just to briefly talk about some important tasks. Um, we've looked at affect recognition quite a bit, looking at the three Vs of human communicative behaviors seeing how that can help us predict emotions, personalities, and sentiment. This was a lot of work in media descriptions. Again, all this started with the boom of research in multimedia, given images and videos, how can you actually caption these? So again, this is a more translation problem. We looked at, um, we looked at multimodal question answering. So in this classic example of visual question answering, I've given an image, I'm gonna give you a question about the image, and my goal is to find out the answer. 
So this requires alignment. You want to, you know, actually look at what color, like localize the objects and figure out the color. So it's mostly alignment and reasoning problem. Uh, multimodal navigation, which extends multimodal QA into interactive settings. So in a visual question answering, you know the answer is right there in the image. But for navigation, you might have to move around the environment before you actually figure out, uh, you actually see the object and be able to figure out the color. Uh, multimodal dialogue, again, extending static settings into more interactive settings. Event recognition, so that's more um, a fusion problem. You have like videos, you have audio, how can you categorize what events and what objects are happening in the video? And information retrieval. So how do you do content-based or a cross-media retrieval from one modality to the other? Again, this is more an alignment or translation problem. Cool. I'm just going to spend the last 10 minutes of the lecture just covering some new directions, which I think are really important. Um, one big one is that of self-supervision, right? People have, all of you have seen this boom in self-supervised learning through unlabeled or weekly supervised data sets. And likewise, people have also kind of done this in the context of multimodal learning. So you have these you know, large transformer models that we have extended to multiple modalities. Uh, we've seen one way to simply just concatenate tokens from different modalities. So across the sequence dimension, I'm going to take my captions, I'm going to add in the image regions. I'm going to treat that as a big long sequence. And then you can define your transformer models on top of that, which basically learns implicit alignment between different parts of the caption and different parts of the image. And then you can start pre-training these models for different tasks. You can define sentence image relationship prediction. So if I give um, a sentence in the image, are they actually describing the same content? And then you can use positive and negative pair sample from the data set to define this um, self-supervised prediction problem. You can do mass language modeling with visual information. So does visual data help me to do mask language prediction? And likewise, you can, on the other side, you can do mask uh, region of image, the so mask visual classification with additional language data. So these are in general, you know, predicting whether a language image from the same pair, that's an explicit alignment problem. Uh, also kind of doing mask prediction, masking language, predicting image, masking image, predicting language, and so on. All these are very useful signals people have found for this, uh, bless you, self-supervised multimodal learning. Again, we say one issue with the previous method is the fact that you have to concatenate all your data in the sequence dimension. And because most transformers depend quadratically on the sequence length, that's gonna be, be a bit computationally expensive. So what you can also do is you can start processing data from each modality first using a transformer and then using these cross attention transformers. So over here, you're basically taking query uh, and keys from one modality to attend to the values of another modality, again, to capture this implicit alignment. And then thereafter, you can define the similar objectives of, uh, of um, you know, mask pre-training. Another option is to, instead of putting visual as the input level, uh, put your visual information into some intermediate representation of your language model. And this is useful for a couple of reasons. Like first of all, if you start putting at intermediate representations, that's gonna be a bit more computationally efficient. You don't have to restart processing your visual data at the input sequence level. And this also allows you to integrate visual features that are not from transformers, right? If I have ResNet features, if I have pre-trained visual features, if I have visual features that are specific to, you know, human gestures, human faces, that might make more sense to integrate at these intermediate layers inside the model. So again, these are just different ways in which you can kind of bias your model to um, primarily starting from language only models, biasing it using visual features, and then doing either prediction or pre-training afterwards. Another area I'm really interested in is beyond language and vision. So you see all the examples, almost all the examples uh, we've talked about today are you know, images, text, sometimes the audio, but there's a whole wide range of modalities beyond that, right? We have like audio time series, four sensors, proprioception sensors, sets, tables, graphs, all these different modalities that exist out there. And these modalities are really, really important because you're working with the robotics data, you're working with that multimedia healthcare data. Typically, you're not gonna be working with uh, images and text, right? Robotics sees all these four sensors and proprioception sensors which basically tells you location of the robot arms. And healthcare has all these time series and tabular information. 
um, and that's important for healthcare. So there's certain directions in representing, um, you know, benchmarking, representing, and fusing all these other modalities. Here's a robotics example I was talking about. Um, these robotics examples have to be pretty robust to external pushes in the force sensor while also being robust to occlusions in the visual modality. In healthcare, you typically have all these time series of a person in the ICU, and you also have all these different tabular information uh, in terms of you know, who the patient is and what's their background and so on. So the tabular information is interesting because um, if, if you all have been following the literature, deep learning doesn't really work that well for tabular data. It works well for these high dimensional images, uh, distributed representations of text, but these tabular data, like your Excel spreadsheets or the table with values, like people still use decision trees and uh, like gradient boosting methods. So how can you perhaps use deep learning for time series data while using these like uh, other machine learning methods for tabular data? That's also a big question. So here was, is one of our papers um, kind of designing these like large scale benchmarks across a wide range of data sets. Like before you even start working on it, you have to have benchmarks to be able to provide the data and measure progress in this field. And at the same time, we've also kind of standardized and composed a bunch of implementations of these multimodal methods. A lot of them, um, the ones that I've talked about in the lecture. So this is for something that includes data sets and models for people to play around with, especially beyond these language and vision modalities. We've also had some progress on designing methods, you know, as a step towards beyond language and vision. Uh, people have kind of studied these unified encoders, again, in language and vision, some work in multimodal, multitask learning, but we actually are able to show that these certain methods are able to generalize to a large number of diverse modalities. So these are methods that work for language, vision, audio, but also image and set data, time series and tabular data, and so on. And the key principles here is that, can we design like a single model across many, many different types of modalities? And the answer is actually yes. As long as you share certain amounts of modality specific embeddings, then the rest of your model, which is essentially a multimodal transformer model, can actually be shared across different modalities. And there's some very interesting results here that you can actually take your model train on one modality, for example, healthcare, uh, which you're training on time series and tables, you take that model and you can directly apply it to some other model, uh, some other data set in the effective computing domain where you have language, vision, and audio. So most of the model stays the same. You just have to change the modality embeddings, which are one hot encodings. And you can directly transfer your model to some other modality and have it do really well. So there's some key ideas of uh, using multitasking and transfer learning in order to achieve this generalization. Very quickly, the very last direction which I want to talk about is that of quantification. So if you recall, I started off by saying there's five, five main research directions people have explored. And in this new survey paper we're going to come up with, there's going to be six main research directions. Well, quantification is that one last research direction. And quantification basically studies, you know, beyond kind of, you've built these models, they work really well, but how can you better understand these models? There's a couple of important directions. One of that is fairness. Um, a lot of multimodal deals with human-centric data, right? Human speech, human gestures, human demographics, bio, bio, biological information, and so on. Are we making sure that these models are actually fair to deploy in the real world? And typically the answer is, is no, unfortunately, right? This experiment actually looked at uh, a, a case study of multimodal prediction from looking at resumes and deciding whether a person should be hired. And they found that these multimodal fusion methods actually reproduce a lot of biases where the outcome is very different from like, you know, males versus females and other, other genders. So that's unfortunate. Um, people in the image captioning, I've also found that if you train an image captioning model, so taking an image, try to generate these captions, it very often picks up on biases in the data set. So for example, this model predicts a man sitting at a desk with a laptop computer, and it basically identified like the image of, the part of the image representing a laptop and directly associated that with the, the, the male gender, which is, uh, which is, again, is a bias that is picked up by the model. Uh, people have also used multimodal learning to detect fake news. So news is inherently a multimodal type of problem. There's language and there's images. How can you use multimodal data to detect fake news? And finally, there's also optimization challenges in multimodal learning. Like it seems like all of these things that I've talked about point to the successes of multimodal learning. 
There's also some optimization challenges, right? Typically, adding different modalities may not help sometimes. And this paper basically tries to investigate why that is. And their main key idea is that if you train with all modalities, these different modalities actually overfit and generalize at different speeds. So you're training on all of them, it's gonna just try to overfit to perhaps the easiest modality, and then it's gonna start ignoring the others. And this paper basically um, outlines some issues of outlines some proposed solutions to better weighting these uh, different modalities during training. And that's all folks. Uh, hopefully that gave you a good introduction to multimodal learning. If you're interested, we have this entire course at CMU, as I mentioned. Um, lecture slides, lecture videos are all publicly available and definitely ping me on email or, or GitHub if there's any questions. Yes. Is there any challenge to actually train the model, model uh, like uh, machine learning models, like to, during the training or inference from a system uh, perspective? Yes, absolutely. So, so the main challenge of multimodal data is that the more modalities you collect, the more computational resources you have to use to process and to you know, integrate all these types of data. So in terms of system challenges, um, you know, one big challenge is you, know, you have all these different ways of encoding like, individual modalities. How do you kind of bring all of them into an integrated system for integrating all of these modalities. Right? You're gonna use convolutional networks, you might use like different pipelines for language and vision. How do you actually bring them together? And it's not something you have an answer to uh, because up to today, you still want to respect the inductive biases of each modality. Um, so there is still no unified system for multimodal learning, if that's what you're asking. Yes. Any other questions? If not, um, you can shoot me an email whenever if you have questions. 